Ah, okay, welcome everybody. That the technology is working, and thank you for the introduction and uh, for the invitation to speak here, for the opportunity to speak here. I'm very excited to see all these uh, young faces, and um, I hope you can enjoy the course. So, as you can tell from the title, this lecture series is going to be about patching and about division algebras. So, here, patching is a method, and I think. You know, when you're a mathematician, you always have to learn new methods. But specifically, I think at your at the point uh, in the career that you're at, it's very important to somehow improve your toolbox and learn more methods. Um, so that's why we picked this subject. But we believe that it's best to learn a new method with an example application in mind, and that's why we decided to uh, also talk about this division algebra project. Um, the standard sort of application for the patching methods is the inverse Galois problem. And maybe I shouldn't say is the inverse Galois problem, but I should say used to be the inverse Galois problem. Because after David and I reformulated the technique a couple of years ago, there's been a flurry of other applications in various other areas of algebra, some of which you'll hear about in the talks. But we just picked one example application that we're going to focus on during the talk, and this is relatively close actually to the inverse Galois problem. It's a sort of division algebra version of the inverse Galois problem. So the plan is that in this first talk today, I'll sort of set you up on the basics. We're going to be going relatively slowly. I think I'm probably not the only one here who's still a bit jet lagged. And um, uh, I'm going to set you up with the basics for the division algebra. It's contrary to the manuscript, for those of you who've been reading the notes, I'm not going to do like a, a course on division algebra but I'm going to introduce things as we need them. And you can read up more material on this in the uh, course notes. And then I'll explain what the main problem is and the, uh, the main result that we're going to be talking about. And also, at some point, I'll say sort of in which directions maybe we want to generalize this. And then I'll indicate some of the proof for the part that actually doesn't use patching. And then there's going to be two lectures about patching tomorrow in which you will actually get your uh, hands on the technique and learn all the basics uh, about that. And then um, in the last talk, uh, we're going to bring it all together and see the patching technique in action on this division algebra problem. So, okay, so what's our basic setup in question? So F is a field, always, and there's going to be some notational problems. Uh, I should use the bigger pen. Uh, because uh, Stefan has a different notation, but I just asked David, should I change it? And he said no. So, because <laughs> we're going to just get into trouble otherwise. So, recall that a central simple algebra over F is a finite dimensional F algebra. which is associative which is simple so it has no non-trivial two-sided ideals and it centers F. So the basic example here is you take a field and you take n by n matrices over the field. That's the basic example you should keep in mind. So a division algebra is a central simple algebra over F again, is a central simple algebra over F, in which you can invert elements. So every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. So um, the most prominent example that you've probably all heard of, of uh, division algebras is the Hamiltonian quaternions. And it's a, it's a pretty nice story that uh, Sir William Rowan Hamilton had been searching for them quite a while. And at some point, uh, because he, he wanted to understand mechanics in three space and somehow model things there. And um, so he was walking in Dublin across a bridge called Broom Bridge with his wife. And then he suddenly, um, 
came up with the right formula after trying for years and years and years. And since there's not very much important stuff going on on this, I'm going to show you. This is still the inscription that's on the board there. So he was struck by a flash of genius and, uh, and discovered these Hamiltonian quaternions. So we're going to need these here. So this is the example. We're going to look at them for various purposes. So you can define them as an R algebra four dimensional by four generators, which are usually called I, J, and K, and such that I squared is equal to J squared is equal to minus one, and I, J is the same as K is equal to minus J, I. So this is the first example that was given of a non-commutative division algebra. Obviously, every field is a division algebra, but those aren't so interesting. This was in 1843, and as it happens so often in mathematics, later on someone found out that uh, this actually wasn't the first uh, person to find the quaternions, namely Gauss had already found them in 1819, but they only found this in his write-up papers uh, and they published it after his death in 1900. Okay. So um, if you look at this division algebra here, then you see obviously it's got several subfields. Well, it's got R as a subfield and then it's got three other subfields that are sitting here and that are all isomorphic to C. For these two, it's obvious that R, uh, Ri and Rj are isomorphic to the complex numbers. Uh, and for the last one, it's very easy to check that that's also the case. So H has, has subfields R and C, isomorphic to R and C. And in general, if you have a division algebra, it's very natural to consider its subfields because every element in the division algebra is going to be in some subfield. So that's just because if you take an element of D's division, so this is in general, and A is in D and not in um, F, so it's a division algebra over F, then you can look at uh, the algebra that's generated by A, so that's then um, strictly bigger than F, and that's obviously contained in D, and because everything is finite dimensional, it's very easy to check that FA is commutative, so FA is a subfield. So it's natural to study subfields. Now, if you're coming from a background of the sort that I come from, then uh, arbitrary field extensions are maybe not your favorite field extensions, but what you really like is um, Galois field extensions. So um, we're going to make the following definition, which is going to be important uh, for this application that we're thinking of. And that's, so we say, if G is a finite group, And we say that G is admissible if there exists a G Galois field extension. So we should say admissible is always with respect to some base field, which is always going to be our field F over F. So um, if there exists a G Galois field extension E over F, and an F division algebra D containing E such that the degree of E over F is the same as the degree of the division algebra. And this is defined to be the square root of the dimension of D as uh, an F algebra. And you know, there's a claim implicitly made in this definition, namely that this dimension is always a square. And you can check in the notes why that's the case. So these are um, the subfields that we're interested in, we're mostly interested in Galois subfields of division algebras with respect to some group. And we're going to ask ourselves the question, what groups can occur? So it's obvious that uh, if a group is admissible over F, then it's a Galois group over F just by the definition. So it's a, a sort of a special 
more specialized question than the inverse Galois problem over f. And it's in some sense over sort of standard fields like the like uh, Q. It's a bit more interesting, at least from my point of view, because you're not, as we, we will see, you can't expect all groups to occur as such um, Galois groups of maximal subfields of division algebra. So we have actually already seen an example of this, namely if you look back at um, the quaternions here, that doesn't work. Now it does. If you look back at the quaternions here and you look at their subfields, then um, if you take the group uh, G to be Z mod 2 Z and it acts um, via complex conjugation, on the field extension C over R, then you see that this division algebra that we had here, the quaternions, they actually contain um, a subfield isomorphic to C, as we already saw, so this group is admissible over R. So that's the very basic example here. So a couple of remarks are in order. And the first one is that um, if you have any subfield of a division algebra, then its degree over the base field is always going to be at most the degree of this division algebra, which is this quantity here. So if you have a field extension E over F that is as in this definition, then uh, this is the maximal number it can be. So this E is going to be a maximal subfield of D. So there's no bigger subfield of D that contains E. So if uh, E over F is as in the definition, then E is a maximal subfield of D. And conversely, um, any maximal subfield uh, satisfy this degree equation. That's no longer true if you uh, don't talk about division algebras, but talk about central simple algebras instead. But for division algebras, that's true. So any maximal subfield satisfies this degree equation. So really, what we're dealing with here is the maximal algebra or Galois subfields of division algebra. The second remark is that if G is admissible with uh, division algebra D and field extension E over F, then the whole structure of D can be just recovered just by knowing E and G. And how does this go? So that's uh, going to be our next definition. And I hope I can put it onto one page. So if G is a finite group, then we say a G crossed product. Division algebra, uh, actually not a division algebra, I'm sorry, uh, algebra uh, over F is defined by, well, what you do is as a vector space, you take for each element of the group, you take a copy of the base field, uh, of, the, of the field uh, Yeah, you take a copy of the field E, right, E, e over F is a finite Galois extension as before. Uh, so take 
a as a vector space to be defined as the direct sum of e times some element u sigma, and sigma runs through the element u z, and um, this way, and uh, these are just generators. And for simplicity, we say u one is equal to one. And then uh, you have to say what the multiplication is. And in order to do this, you take a two co-cycle. So what is this? Um, you take a two co-cycle of G in E cross. So this is a map C from G cross G to E cross that satisfies the following, maybe slightly awkward looking conditions. So it's... Um, if you apply the co-cycle, if you take three elements in the group, that's what this is going to be about, they're called sigma, tau, and rho, and you apply the co-cycle to tau and rho, and you apply sigma to that, and then you multiply this with uh, the co-cycle applied to sigma and tau rho, then that should be the same as taking uh, sigma tau comma rho and putting that into the uh, co-cycle C and then multiplying it with t and sigma and tau. So this is for all uh, sigma, tau, and rho in G. And we want this to be so-called normalized. Which just means that if you apply C to any to the identity comma something, then that's one, and that's also if you apply C to something, comma the same. So this is this two co-cycle, and now you can say what is actually the um, multiplication. So far, this is just a vector space. I've now given this additional datum, this two co-cycle, and this is going to help me to find the multiplication. So the multiplication is defined by the following rules. So if you take u sigma and you um, multiply it to the right by an element of e, then you kind of want to move the b to the left, and that costs you something. You have to apply the element sigma, the automorphism sigma of e over f, to um, b, and that is what it costs you to move it to the other side. So over all b and e. And the last thing we need to know is how do we multiply two generators? And so that's governed by this two co-cycle. So if we apply u, uh, if we multiply u sigma and u tau, then um, we can get c times sigma tau times u tau. Okay. So uh, the claim implicitly made here that I'm going to just write down as a lemma is a G cross product algebra is a central simple algebra. Full stop. So there's loads of things you have to prove, and I encourage you to do this little exercise that's also in our notes. Uh, lots of little things that you should prove if you were trying to um, show that this statement is true. Well, first you should maybe check that it's independent of the co-cycle. Oh, the remark maybe for those of you who know cohomology, uh, every cohomology class is represented by a normalized two co-cycle, so we're not losing anything here. And uh, then if you check that it's associative, which was one of the conditions for our central simple algebras, then you're going to actually see what this co-cycle condition is good for, because that's exactly what this amounts to. And that makes it maybe look a bit more natural. And then you're going to obviously have to check that there's an identity, you're going to have to check simplicity, and that the center is actually f. And uh, I think at that point we're pretty much done. Again, we've already seen um, an example, and from what I've said before, that if you have an admissible group, then the corresponding division algebra should be such a cross product. This should be obvious. So the example, again, is the quaternions. So let's look at that briefly and see how it works in this case. So we had the quaternions, and there we had this subfield. We're going to pick this one as our subfield C, and then the rest of this 
was uh, this times the generator J. So this already looks a bit like what we need for uh, our um, algebra here. So we have our finite GL extension C over R. We have this structure here. So we just get that U sigma is equal to J, where sigma is the generator of Z minus Z equals to Z. And then the only thing we need to check is that these relations work out. So let's see if we take U sigma and we multiply it by an element a, then what do we get? Well, we get j, and this a is an element in here, so we can write it as alpha plus i beta, and then uh, you can see that um, because of the commutation rule, if you move this over to the other side, because j i is equal to minus i j, you actually really do get alpha minus i j beta. So this is exactly what we want because this is the same as sigma of a times u sigma. And the other rule is easy to check. So uh, this is obviously not a proof, but you can use this to soup it up and actually show that if whenever you have a, um, an admissible group that this actually is such a G cross product extension. So group admissible. with division algebra D and subfield E, then uh, this D is a G cross product extension. And that's not so much hard to check. So um, uh, let me just remark at this point that in general these G cross products are not divisible so we can use this algebra and we're going to in the constructions that we do later construct some such um, cross product algebras and we're going to have to check are they actually divisional algebras because we want them to be divisional so we need some way of doing that and um, this can be done especially uh, easily for a certain class of algebras, which is another example of G cross products, and these are the so-called cyclic algebras. So let me just introduce those briefly here so we can read them later. So um, you take a cyclic group G of order n, and you take L over F. G Galois extension. And then uh, we pick a generator, sigma for G, and an element in F, which is non zero. And then we define the following two co cycles. We pick representatives between um, zero and n minus one of. Uh, any uh, integer, and then we can say we say that the co-cycle is called zeta, and it depends on sigma and a. Now we want to apply this to two elements of the group. Any element of the group is a power of sigma, and we can pick the representative in this set. So um, we say that this is actually equal to one if i plus j is less than one, and it's equal to a if i plus j is bigger than one. And then you can check that this is a normalized two cycle. And when you do that, you have to remember that um, uh, when you multiply two things here and you actually get an exponent that's bigger than n minus one, then you have to replace it by something that's between zero and one to make the definition work. And then it's a very easy case by case sort of calculation uh, to check that this is actually a normalized two cold cycle. So um, now we can define the cyclic algebra. Let's see if I can still put this here. It's 
usually denote it by A, and then you put this field extension, B over F, and then you also put this element of sigma, which are the parameters that this depends on. This is defined to be the crust product algebra. Algebra with respect to G and this field. And you can write down what its multiplication looks like a bit more explicitly, and since we're going to need that later, I'm not going to do that here. So, as we said, as an algebra, it's generated by um, a copy of E for every element in the group. So, this is called a cyclic algebra. So A is equal to um, rec sum i is to zero for n minus one, and then you have a copy of E, and then you have some generator, and you take the powers of that generator, and you can compute that, and uh, then you just need to know how this uh, commutes with an element of um, E, and as you can guess, this looks like this, so this is the field of E, and then you already know what e to the i times e to the j is unless i plus j is bigger than n minus 1. And so you only need to know what e to the n is and e to the n. Oh, this is bad. It's broken now. Oh, dear. Because we already fixed our element a, and that's what e to the n is in that case. OK, so th these are the cyclic algebras, and they're maybe one of the most important uh, examples of these crossed product algebras. And those are the ones that uh, are going to come up in the proof in a later lecture. And they're just a good example to keep in mind. So I don't really need this, but I'll put this in the code here anyway. So um, at this point, uh, it's maybe not so surprising that in terms of admissibility of groups, there's the following theorem. This is maybe the first thing that was known about this problem even though it wasn't formulated in these terms, and this is due to Brouwer, Hasse, and Noether. And uh, it states that every cyclic group is admissible over Q. So for every cyclic group, there exists a Galois extension, which is a maximal subfield of some Q division. And then if you want to push this further, then you get to the theorem that we're actually interested in, which is due to Shacker. And I think I need to put this in the code here. And this is um, actually a condition in the other direction. And this is what I was saying before, that it's not the case that you could expect every finite group to be admissible over Q. And the theorem says that if G is admissible, over Q, then all zero subgroups of G are um, meta cyclic. So what does that mean? It means they're extensions of a cyclic group by another cyclic group. The theorem actually has a second part where he proves um, that the converse is also true for certain classes of groups. Uh, and that obviously created a whole industry. And then people tried to see what, uh, uh, which of these groups, which are also called silo metacyclic groups, um, actually occur as Galois groups of maximal subfields of division algebras over Q. And um, I think the most far-reaching result in this direction, if we want to talk about sort of general things, is um, a result due to Sun 
which says that the converse is true for the solvable groups. I mean, I shouldn't say true, it's shown. Yeah, so this is saying that if you have a solvable group, all of the pseudo except groups are net distinctive, then it's actually admissible over Q. Um, that is not the end of the story, because there are loads of groups which are pseudo net distinctive and are not solvable. So for example, if you take S5, it's known to be admissible, but it's uh, and it's pseudo net cyclic, but as you all hopefully know, it's not solvable. But Shakur did conjecture um, that the converse should be true. So this is known, but conjectured. This still fits. Conjectured. Conjecture. I'm also going to do that. And Shakur already did that. So that's conjecture. So there's a similar conjecture and um, uh, theorem in. Um, for function fields over finite fields, and that's maybe even uh, closer to what we're going to be doing, but uh, I'm not going to get into that um, so much for this, I guess. But as, as I said, loads of cases are known, and there are interesting example cases uh, that don't fall under this general class of groups for which it is known. So the theorem that we're going to be talking about in this lecture series is due to David Harberger, myself, and Daniel Thrashen. And that goes as follows. So we take um, K, the complete discretely valued field, um, with algebraically closed residue fields. little k, and this is where the notation differs, so if, if, if you take the valuation from here, then that would be Stefan's O, but then this is not the fraction field, so it's actually the residue field. Um, and it is equal to k bar because it's algebraically closed, but <laughs> in a different sense, yeah. And uh, we take a one variable function field over and we take G a finite group um, such that the characteristic of some group function in the residue field does not provide the order of G. And then we can show G is admissible over if and only if all pseudo except groups G are, and I'm going to say, abelian metacyclic. So this doesn't quite look the same way as uh, what we had here. They were just assumed to be metacyclic, but it turns out that in the course of the proof, because of the assumption we made on the residue field that it's algebraically closed, you actually get um, uh, abelian metacyclic. You could also say abelian of rank minus two, which is the same thing, but I wanted to make it look a bit more analogous to Shackers. Is that a question? Well, the, the, if the silo is the sub group, it's a free group. But I. No, I don't think there's any explanation for this. It's an arbitrary thing. Whether cyclic or cyclic. 
Okay. Um, so what we're going to restrict our attention to in this um, lecture series here in trying to prove this theorem is the case where um, we take a particular uh, complete discretely valued field, namely we take the um, residue field and we take Laurent series over that. So that's going to be our field K. And then we're going to look at the line over that, which Stefan already considered. And uh, that's going to then be, uh, just give us a function field, which is generated by one variable, which is going to be called X. So this is a uh, simple case that we're going to be looking at. And the aim of this lecture series is to understand mostly this constructive direction of the proof. So if you know that all silo subgroups of G are abelian metacyclic, can you then deduce that uh, G is admissible? So we're going to explicit, well, relatively explicitly construct a G cross products division algebra um, over this field F from a G that satisfies this condition. And the aim of the course is, other than to understand how this proof goes and to see how this uses this patching technique, is then to try and generalize this by, for example, uh, weakening some of the assumptions here. So for example, to study what happens if you drop this assumption on the residue characteristic, also maybe replace F by some similar but slightly different fields and some other types of problems in similar directions. So that's going to be the aim of the course. Now today I'm just going to use the last um, couple of minutes to actually say a little bit about this other direction that doesn't use the patching technique or at least doesn't have to use the patching technique. And so um, we want to show that if G is admissible, and satisfies this actual extra characteristic assumption, then every zero subgroup is of G is abelian metacyclic. Okay, and in order to do that, we actually need to recall a little bit more about uh, division algebras and partially the reason why I'm telling you a little bit about this direction, well, one for sort of the sake of completeness, Great. but also because it gives me um, an opportunity to mention the word manifestation. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you should uh, you should have some idea of how this goes. So recall that um, if you take a central simple algebras over F, then you can tensor them over F, and the tensor product of the central simple now, if you want to tensor two division algebras, that's actually not going to be a division algebra, that tensor product anymore in general. So you have a problem here. Uh, if you try to um, induce a multiplication on this on the set of division algebras, there's a theorem that comes to the rescue, which is the Wedderburn's theorem. And Wedderburn says that every uh, central simple algebra is of the form max n e, so it's matrices, n by n matrices, over some division algebra d, and some n. And n and d are actually um, uniquely determined. I mean, n is uniquely determined, and d is uniquely determined like that. So this comes to the rescue, and so you can, do, you can basically use this to um, define the tensor product of division algebras. So you say that if A and B are division maps, then uh, you write A tensor B map N D and then you define the product of A and B just being map D. Okay. 
And what you get when you do this construction, as you probably all know, is a beautiful strip, which is the frog river frog, which can be, uh, so it's a set of provision arguments over f to this multiplication. Or you can also say it's the set of equivalence classes of central simple algebras with the, ten, with the um, product induced by the tensor product, where equivalence just means you um, that A and B are equivalent if they have the same underlying division. So this is a commutative group, and it's usually written in additive notation because of that. And so um, if you have an element in there, so this is called the Frau group. You have an element in there, its period is the order in the bra group. And what is known is that now if you have a um oh, I don't need to do that. And, and, and this is always fine. So this this actually makes sense. So we're now going to um, do the following. We're going to study um, with this f as before. Uh, a set of discrete valuations on f. And then um, for each v in the set, we're going to let k sub v, the Morton residue field, with respect to that valuation. And then we can define the following subset, Brower of f prime, to be the set of all alphas in the Brower group, such that um, the period of alpha is prime to the characteristic of the vector. So all the omega. So theoretically, this prime notation here it depends on this, this uh, set omega, but we're going to suppress that extra little um, notational thing. So it is known. And you can find this, for example, in Saltman's book, that there exists for v and omega a homomorphism that goes from this power of f prime to h1, the residue field, v1, z. And if you don't know what this is, don't worry about it too much. Um, uh, all we need is a certain property, and this is going to be only a sketch of the proof anyway. So this is a homomorphism that goes into this uh, cohomology group, first cohomology group. Um, no, they're, they don't have to be true. They may be, but they don't have to be. And so we define... Um, product homomorphism that now goes from power of f prime to uh, the direct product over all v and omega, h1 kv v1 z. And then we say that an element alpha in this power of f prime is determined by ramification if the period of alpha is the same as the period of ram sub v of alpha for at least one v and omega. Yeah, so in general, um, if you have the periods to the order of an element here, 
well, I guess here I should say the order, but I'm still saying it wrong. Um, if you have uh, the period of an element here, then it's it's uh, the um, LCM of the periods of the elements there, but uh, you want the period actually to stay the same. So you want one valuation, and we're going to complete, but let's get back to that valuation in a minute, that somehow captures enough of the information about this cohomology class, alpha. So um, a result of calling for len for Jangelin and Parimala then asserts there exists a set omega such that the following holds this ram omega um, is injective. And if you fix a prime p, then none of the residue fields in the case of v for v and omega has characteristic p. So this is going to help us um, actually um, show this forward direction of the theorem. There's one last thing I need to say that I was tempted to say earlier. If you have any element alpha in the bar group of F, then you can write alpha as alpha P plus alpha minus alpha P, where the period of alpha, that's now a number, and you can take the P part of it, and that's the same as the period of alpha P, and then uh, the period of alpha minus alpha p is fine. So now if you take an element alpha in the bar group of f and the set omega as above with this extra condition, then alpha p uh, is determined. By ramifications. And I don't have time to do the proof here, but um, it's actually very simple. Uh, so it could have been done here. So the first thing you see is that alpha p, by this assumption here on the residue, um, is actually an element in this drawer of s prime. So this actually makes sense. You can apply it, the ramification homomorphism to it. And then you want to know does the period stay the same? But because this is now um, an element of p power order, uh, the LCM is, is the same as the max, and so then it's relatively easy to show that because uh, the ramification homomorphism is injective, it has to be determined by ramification. So at this point, we can do the proof sketch of the forward direction of our theorem. Namely, you do the following. You fix a prime, and this is the prime that the silo subgroup uh, Silo subgroup we want to consider, um, which divides the order of G, right? Otherwise, there's nothing to do. And that makes already, um, the, by the assumption that we made on the characteristic of G, shows us that um, uh, this P is not equal to the characteristic of our field little k. And then we let this omega as above. So with these two additional properties here, according to this P. And then um, we assume we have this G cross product division algebra. And then you look at uh, the um, p part of its class, and then is this is determined by ramification. By our lemma, and so pick that valuation v. And with respect to that, more or less, you study the uh,
you study the extension of E over P alpha P, and actually you look at completions here, uh, where P is just a pretty scary subgroup. And then, as Stefan said, you're in a local case, and you can apply all the theory that's known there, and that makes it very easy to uh, see that it's actually meta-cyclic. And then by the assumption on the residue field, you can use Comer theory to actually see if it really doesn't matter. I'll shorten this a little bit here at this point because my time is up. But um, actually, this is not really the part you have to deeply understand in order to work on the project. We just thought for the sake of completeness, you should also see how this works. There's one more ingredient in the proof that I should mention, namely that for such fields as we're considering here, it's known that the period of an element in the bar group is equal to what's called the index, and that's a result that can also be used uh, to prove using patching. So uh, that's all for now, and uh, I'll